My name is Ed Lyerman. I'm the director of Geneva Campus Ministry here at the University of Iowa. I recently succeeded Jason Chen, who many of you know, I'm sure. And uh, if you would like more information about Geneva Campus Ministry and some of the programs that we offer, there are some brochures. And uh, also, I invite you, there are brochures about our Finding God at Iowa series. Once a month, staff and professors at the university speak about their experience of faith and how that impacts their studies, their work, their lives, and especially call your attention to the next event, which will be a panel discussion, October 7, which will follow up on tonight's topic. And the topic then will be church and the state's role in a pluralistic society or in pluralistic societies. And that will be a panel discussion. So Friday, October 7, noon to 1 at River Room number 1 at the IMU. Invite you all to that as well. Secondly, uh, just note that uh, Lucy Shaw will be our next Geneva lecturer, a poet, and she will be here February 11 and 12. So watch for information about that. The Geneva Lecture Series is now entering its 29th year. And in that series, once or twice a semester, we bring to campus noted scholars, writers, artists, practitioners in various fields to bring a Christian perspective to the issues that face the university and face our communities and our world. I want to thank our committee and the many co-sponsors that we have for this event. The format tonight is that after Dr. Witte's lecture, he will receive questions and we have a microphone that will be passed around so that your question can be heard by everyone. And also the lecture and the question period is being taped and immediately after this lecture, uh, cassette tapes will be available for $4. So avail yourself of that, at the, be at the table right back there. Also, as you came in, the ushers gave you an evaluation form. We would really appreciate it if you would uh, fill that out before you leave and uh, leave it with the ushers. Also, please remember to turn off your cell phones and pagers and all those kind of things. Our lecturer tonight is John Witte, Jr., a native of Ontario, a graduate of Calvin College, and also of Harvard Law School, where he received his JD degree. He is married and has two daughters. And he says that's his uh, major accomplishment in life. But uh, he has some other accomplishments as well. It has really been unusual to try to keep up with the resume of Dr. Witte. When the committee first contacted him a year or so ago, his resume read that he was the author or editor of 12 books, not to mention 120 scholarly articles. By the time I came on board in July, he was the author of 18 books. Last week, I heard it was 19 books, so it's probably 20 books this week. Uh, so he obviously uh, produces a great volume of scholarly work. But what impressed me was not only the sheer volume of his work, but also the breadth of his interests. Some of his titles include Religion and the American Constitutional Experiment, Proselytism and Orthodoxy in Russia, The New War for Souls, From Sacrament to Contract, Looking at uh, Law and um, Marriage and Religion and Law in the West, Human Rights in Judaism. Just a wonderful breadth, but also a great historical depth, having written about law and Protestantism and uh, looking at the whole history of, uh, of law. But not only is he uh, a fine scholar, but he's an excellent teacher. I think it was something like eight out of the nine uh, years past, he was voted the most outstanding teacher at Emory Law School. And I'm assuming that year you missed John, you must have been on sabbatical or something. Yeah. 
And then in his spare time, he has lectured in practically every country in Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Russia, South Africa, Israel, um, all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of places. But there is one huge gap that I noticed in his resume. With all his globe trotting and all of his uh, speaking and hosting conferences at different places around the world, he had never been to Iowa until this trip. And so, uh, John, we're filling a huge gap in your resume and in your life experience. And fortunately, we went on the principle that if you book it, he will come. And so he is here. And it is my great privilege to present to you Mr. John, Dr. John Whitty, Jr., the Jonas, Jonas Robisher Professor of Law and Ethics and Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at the School of Law at Emory University in Atlanta. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Larman, for that very warm and generous introduction. Yes, this is the apex of being here in Iowa. I have enjoyed my time here a great deal, enjoyed this beautiful city and beautiful campus. I feel very privileged to be part of this distinguished lecture series. I want to say a very special word of thanks to Dr. Larman and members of the Geneva Campus Ministries Board for not vetoing the nomination for me to serve as speaker today so that I have the privilege, in fact, of being at the University of Iowa. I appreciate you folks being here this evening, especially on a cold night, and I shall not keep you too long. As I was pondering my remarks for this evening, I drew some inspiration from a story that Justice William O. Douglas of the U.S. Supreme Court used to tell about his father. Justice Douglas's father was an itinerant preacher. He served part-time in a number of churches that were too small to afford their own full-time pastors. And one Sunday morning, the Reverend Douglas appeared in a small church to lead the service and deliver the sermon and he discovered on his arrival there was but one solitary soul in the entire sanctuary, and this was a young cowboy visiting from the West. So before proceeding, the Reverend Douglas came down off the pulpit and approached this solitary soul in the sanctuary and asked him if he really wanted to have the entire liturgy read and the full sermon delivered. The young man was very uncomfortable, and he frowned, and he fidgeted, and he scratched his chin a little, and finally said, well, I'm just a cowhand from Montana, and I don't know much, but I do know that if I went out in the middle of winter to feed the herd, and I found only one cow left, I sure would not leave her to starve. Well, thus encouraged, the Reverend Douglas literally bounded up onto the pulpit. He read through his entire liturgy. He delivered his full sermon, fire and brimstone and all. And after finally completing his efforts, he came down off the pulpit and approached this solitary soul in the sanctuary and said, what'd you think? And the young man, again, was very uncomfortable and he frowned and he fidgeted and he scratched his chin a little and finally said, well, I'm just a cowhand from Montana. And I don't know much, but I do know that if I went out in the middle of winter to feed the herd and I found only one cow left, I sure would not dump my entire load of feed on just that one cow. <laughs> this evening, I propose to dump the entire load on you. The pretentious title of my lecture, as you saw, is Separation of Church and State, Facts, Fictions, and Future Challenges. This lecture is something of a response to a whole cottage industry of important new books and articles and briefs and judicial opinions that have emerged in the past decade devoted to the history of separation of church and state, especially in America. We now know a great deal more than we did a decade ago about the history of separationist rhetoric from Thomas Jefferson's famous 1802 letter to the Danbury Baptist Association to Justice Hugo Black's opinion in the famous 1947 case of Everson versus Board of Education, both of which we'll be revisiting. 
We now know a good deal more about the odious manipulation of separationist rhetoric by the Ku Klux Klan and other nativist groups against Catholics and Jews and other minority faiths and emigrants in the later 19th and the early 20th centuries. And we now see a good deal more clearly than we did before that Justice Black drew some of his inspiration from these nativist teachings, particularly those of the Ku Klux Klan, of which he had been a ranking member in crafting his famous Everson opinion for the Supreme Court. For peculiar souls like me, who labor on the history of law, religion, and the First Amendment, this has all been a rather sobering but edifying corrective to the traditional story. But the newly corrected story of religious liberty is beginning quickly to create its own ample distortions of the historical record. The first distortion I submit is the argument that the principle of separation of church and state was an invention of 19th century anti-clerical and anti-religious elites, starting with Thomas Jefferson. The second distortion is the argument that this principle of separation was hijacked by anti-Catholic and then anti-clerical and then anti-religious nativists who introduced all manner of prejudicial changes in late 19th and early 20th century American law in the name of separation of church and state, but ultimately to the detriment of religious liberty for all. Because of its recent paternity and because of its odious pedigree, it's now regularly argued, we should discard the principle of separation of church and state and some of the harsher laws that it occasioned, including those old laws against state funding and support of religious institutions and causes. I respectfully disagree with this new history and the conclusions that are being drawn from it. My reading of the sources leads me to conclude that separation of church and state has a much longer history and a much more complex and wholesome pedigree than some recent history writing seems to allow. This evening I'd like to argue that long before Jefferson sat down to pen his 1802 letter to the Danbury Baptists, the 18th century American founders had at least five distinct understandings of separation of church and state, several of those with deep Western roots. Each of these five understandings made important contributions to the protection of religious liberty in the 18th and the 19th centuries. And most of these understandings still hold enduring lessons for us today. Separation of church and state is not the only teaching that the First Amendment offers us in its religion clauses, but it is an essential principle of religious liberty which we in America would reject at our peril. So first let's rummage through some library dust together as historians. Separation of church and state is often regarded as a distinctly American and relatively modern invention. In reality, separationism is an ancient Western teaching ultimately rooted in the Bible. The Hebrew Bible repeatedly commanded the chosen people of ancient Israel to remain separate from the Gentile world around them and to separate the Levites and other temple officials from the rest of the people. The Hebrew Bible also made much of building and rebuilding walls to protect the city of Jerusalem from the outside world and to separate the temple and its priests from the commons and its peoples. Significant still reflected in the rituals that occur at the Wailing or Western Wall of Jerusalem to this day. The New Testament warned Christian believers repeatedly to remain separate, non-conform from the world and its temptations and ever mindful that their true citizenship lies in heaven. Echoing the Hebrew Bible, St. Paul spoke in Ephesians 2 literally of a, quote, wall of separation between Christians and non-Christians interposed 
by the law of God. These biblical passages have inspired a long history of Western reflection on separation and on the wall of separation between church and state. The archives hold a massive farrago of patristic medieval and early modern sermons and biblical commentaries and pamphlets and books that call for a separation between the faithful and the fallen, the religious and the political, the clergy and the laity, the spiritual and the temporal, the church and the state. At the same time, churchmen and statesmen over the centuries forged countless treaties, statutes, and constitutional texts to define and delimit their respective offices and powers and to determine their mutual duties and rights vis-a-vis -vis each other and the broader communities of which they are respectively a part. These theological and political teachings were distilled into powerful models of separationism. Two ways, two cities, two powers, two swords, two kingdoms, and other dualistic constructions. Many of these models were transmitted across the Atlantic to the American colonies and then transmuted to accommodate local colonial conditions. The 18th century American founders called on this European and colonial legacy to press at least five concerns in the name of separation of church and state. First, the principle of separation was invoked as a means to protect the church from the state. Give myself a little light. Perhaps no enlightenment for you, but I get light. <laughs> So first, the principle of separation was invoked as a means to protect the church from the state. This had been a common Christian understanding of separation since the first century. It was captured in the Christian clergy's perennial call thereafter for freedom of the church, libertas ecclesiae, or what the great edict of Milan of 313 for the first time in the West called the free exercise of religion and of religious groups. The 18th century American founders' principal concern was to protect church affairs from state intrusion, church properties from state encroachment, church rules and liturgies from political coercion and control. This understanding of separation was prominent in 18th century America. The great New England Puritan jurist Elisha Williams spoke for many churchmen when he wrote in 1744, every church has the right to judge in what manner God is to be worshiped by them, and what form of discipline ought to be observed by them, and what clergy ought to be elected by them, from all of which the state must be utterly and completely separate. George Washington wrote in 1785 of the need, quote, to establish effectual barriers so that there was no threat to the religious rights of any ecclesiastical society, including particularly beleaguered minorities like Jews and Catholics and Quakers, whom Washington favored with a number of touching and tender letters. Thomas Jefferson called for government to resist what he termed intermeddling with religious institutions, their doctrines, disciplines, or exercises. Every religious society, Jefferson wrote in 1784, has a right to determine for itself the times for these exercises and the objects proper for them according to their own peculiar tenets, and none of this can concern or involve the state whatsoever. This first understanding of separation of church and state was captured especially in state constitutional guarantees of the free exercise rights of peaceable religious groups. The right of religious bodies to incorporate and to hold property, to appoint and remove clergy and other officials, to have sites and rights of worship, education, charity, mission, burial, to maintain standards of entrance and exit for their members and more, all of which were specified sometimes in great detail by early state constitutions and by subsequent implementing legislation. This understanding of separationism was also at least implicit in the First Amendment free exercise guarantee. 
earlier drafts of the First Amendment and the cryptic 1789 House debates that have survived about these drafts spoke repeatedly of the need to protect religious sects, denominations, groups, or societies to guarantee their rights to worship, property, practice, exercise. None of this concern for the detailed rights of religious groups was rejected in the surviving House debates and can at least be plausibly read into the generic free exercise guarantee that was ultimately passed in the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Second, the 18th century American founders invoked the principle of separation to protect not only the church from the state, but also the state from the church. This was a more recent Western understanding, but it became increasingly prominent in the 17th and 18th centuries on both sides of the Atlantic. The sorest tyrannies have been those that have united the royalty and the priesthood in one person, wrote the authors of Cato's letters in 1723. Churchmen, when they ruled states, had not only double authority, but also double insolence and remarkably less mercy in regard to conscience, property, and to the domains and demands of statecraft. In the same vein, John Adams devoted much of his 1774 dissertation on the canon and the feudal law to documenting what he called the tyrannous outrages that the medieval Catholic Church and the early modern Protestant churches had inflicted through their control of state authority. This was a, quote, wicked confederacy between two systems of tyranny, Adams wrote with ample, ample bitterness. This second understanding of separation helped to inform the movement in some states to exclude ministers and other religious officials from participating in political office. Such exclusions had been commonplace among 17th century American Puritans and various Baptist groups. But arguments for such clerical exclusions became more commonplace in 18th century America among a variety of groups. Seven of the original 13 states and 15 later states banned ministers from serving in political office. State constitutional prohibitions that were not formally outlawed until the 1978 Supreme Court case of McDaniel versus Patty. Third, the principle of separation of church and state was invoked as a means to protect the individual's liberty of conscience from the intrusions of either the church or the state, or worse, both of them conspiring together. This had been an early an enduring understanding of separationism among colonial Baptists and Quakers. This argument became more prominent in 18th century America. Every man has an equal right to follow the dictates of his own conscience in the affairs of religion, Elisha Williams wrote again in 1744. And this is an equal right with any rulers, be they civil or ecclesiastical, church types or state types. James Madison put this case in his 1785 memorial and remonstrance, calling for what he named a great barrier between church and state to defend the religious rights of the individual and his conscience. Thomas Jefferson's famous 1802 letter to the Danbury Baptist Association also tied the principle of separation of church and state directly to the principle of liberty of conscience. After his brief opening salutation, Jefferson's famous letter reads as follows, and I quote, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between a man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence the act of that whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, comma, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, 
I shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced he has no natural right in opposition to his social duties. In Jefferson's formulation here, separation of church and state assured individuals of their natural rights of conscience, which could be exercised freely and fully up to the point of the shirking or breaching their social duties. Jefferson is not talking here about separating politics and religion altogether, as is so often said. Indeed, in the very next paragraph of his letter, President Jefferson performed an avowedly religious act of offering prayers as the president on behalf of his Baptist correspondents. He wrote, I reciprocate your kind prayers for the protection and blessing of the common father and creator of man. Fourth, the principle of separation of church and state was occasionally used to argue for the protection of individual states from interference by the federal government in governing local religious affairs. Jefferson sometimes used separation in this federalist jurisdictional sense as well. Jefferson said many times that the federal government had no business over, no jurisdiction over religion. Religion was an ent entirely a state and a local affair in his view. As he put it famously in his second inaugural, in matters of religion, I have considered that its free exercise is placed by the Constitution independent of the federal government. I have therefore undertaken on no occasion to prescribe the religious exercises suited to it, but have left them as the Constitution found them under the direction and discipline of state or church authorities. The separation that Jefferson had in mind here was between local church-state relations and the federal government. The federal government could not interfere in the affairs of local churches, and the federal government could not interfere in the affairs of local states vis-a-vis -vis those local churches. Under this federalist jurisdictional reading of separationism, state governments were free to patronize and protect religion or to prohibit or abridge religion as their own state constitutions allowed or required. But the federal government was entirely foreclosed from the same. Some scholars have imputed this fourth understanding of separation of church and state into the First Amendment provision that says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. The argument is that Congress shall make no law respecting a state establishment of religion. After all, in 1789, when the First Amendment was being drafted, six states still had some form of religious establishment, which both their state legislatures and their state constitutional conventions had just defined and defended, often against very strong opposition from religious dissenters. Moreover, Virginia had just passed Jefferson's bill for the, quote, establishment of religious freedom, also against firm opposition, now by traditional Anglican establishmentarians. Having just defended their state establishments of whatever sort at home, the new members of Congress were not about to relinquish control of them to the new federal government. This is a plausible reading of this mysterious respecting language in the First Amendment Establishment Clause, though the evidence for this reading from the first congressional record is remarkably thin. This Federalist reading of the Establishment Clause, however, is becoming more prominent today, especially among originalists in the academy and on the federal bench. It was given especially strong expression in a couple of recent concurring opinions by Justice Thomas in the Newdow Pledge of Allegiance case a couple of years ago and the recent Van Orden Ten Commandments case just issued a couple of months ago. This attempt to refederalize the First Amendment, if that's what it is, is part and product of the court's neo-federalist revolution in many areas of constitutional law. And some of you from the law school will know about Commerce Clause and Section 5 power and other things where this neo-federalist revolution is alive and well. Thank you. 
Fifth and finally, the principle of separation of church and state was sometimes adduced as a means to protect society and its members from unwelcome participation in and support for religion. Already in later colonial America, several religious groups used separationism in this way to argue against the established church's policies of mandatory payments of tithes or required participation in swearing oaths or forced attendance at religious services or compulsory registration of church properties and more. At the turn of the 19th century, the language of separation of church and state also began to fuel broader campaigns to remove traditional forms of religion in law, politics, and society altogether, and to end the special state protection, patronage, and participation in religion that had been long commonplace. This was the most novel and the most controversial understanding of separation of church and state in the young American Republic. But it began to gain ample rhetorical currency in the course of the 19th century. The first notorious instance of this came in 1800, during the heated election debates between Thomas Jefferson's Republican Party and incumbent John Adams's Federalist Party. This was a clash of propaganda machines that made the last bush carry election debates look like child's play. Adams' party accused Jefferson of being the Antichrist, the whore of Babylon, a Jacobin infidel and secularist bent on destruction of the necessary religious foundations of law and necessary alliances of church and state. Jefferson's party, in turn, accused Adams of being a Puritan pope, a religious tyrant, bent on subjecting the whole nation to his suffocatingly narrow beliefs and to his smug, self-serving northern ministers who stood four square against liberty and progress. These proved to be only the opening shots in a century-long American battle over the meaning and means of separating church and state. The battles broke out thereafter with equally vitriolic rhetoric over issues like dueling, Freemasonry, lotteries, drunkenness, Sunday law, slavery, marriage, divorce, women's property rights, women's suffrage, religious education, prosecution for blasphemy, enforcement of Christian morals, 